Last time we spoke about making good manga, we dove into the basic structure of how you can utilize various tips and tricks to get your reader to turn the page. What is eye-catching? What are ways to stand out from other series? How can you as an artist or a writer make your story your own? If you haven't watched that video, I highly recommend it for this discussion, and I have that linked here. Continue in Hirohiko Araki's book, Manga in Theory and Practice. After mastering the first principles of what we reviewed in the last video, he dives into two more critical aspects of any story and how to pursue them. That being character design, both in the sense of motivation and visualization, and story. Before we get into it, I want to give a quick side note. My intention for this series is to use Araki's book as a guiding discussion tool instead of a crutch. So while I'll be referencing this book throughout the rest of the videos I post on this topic, I won't be giving you a detailed summary of every chapter. Araki goes far deeper into discussions than what I plan on covering here, and also includes tidbits about the industry that wouldn't fit into the flow of this video. I definitely recommend picking it up if you're interested. Let's get on to character design. Even before looking at what either Rocky or I have to say about it, I want you to think very critically about how a character's design impacts manga specifically. Manga is different from any book you've ever read. The thing that makes manga and comics unique is the aspect of how the drawing and the story interact and weave together to make a compelling narrative flow. Common saying in theater and cinema is show, don't tell. In a book, you have to tell. In manga, that's the step between these two mediums. What can you convey about a character by their design? How can you utilize the way that manga is produced, drawn, and laid out to effectively convey the message that your character is putting out there? Instead of thinking, I want to draw a tough, badass character who doesn't take anything from anyone, instead, I want you to think about a character who has gone through certain events throughout their life to make them distrustful of others, and in turn, has to be tough. If your character has a scar over their eye, maybe they got that from someone they trusted in the past, and that in turn impacted the rest of their disposition, and therefore influenced their tough appearance. It's only because of what they've gone through. Now, at a subconscious level, they've started to dress more closed off from others because of the betrayal. Literal and metaphorical armor puts distance and protection between them and others. At the point of their introduction to us as readers, it's because they've already had character growth and progression that we haven't seen yet, and that's why they look like someone who is tough and doesn't take any bull from anyone. It's because of their outlook, not because of the role you want them to play. Characters' motivations drive your story and how they look, not you. When looking at your characters, are you making your character's design serve multiple purposes like we discussed in the first video? To look at an example in manga, I've talked about it once before, but since it's one of my favorite series, I'm going to talk about it again, because hey, it's my show. In Full Metal Alchemist, brothers Edward and Alphonse Elric lose their bodies due to their own doing. They cross an uncrossable line, they attempt to do what should have never been attempted by trying to raise the dead. Due to this, and through a more technical issue that's explained in the story that I won't bother explaining here, Alphonse loses his body entirely, and the experiment also takes Ed's leg. Alphonse is basically disintegrated in front of his brother, and in order to bring him back, Ed sacrifices part of his body, his arm, to tie his brother's soul to that suit of armor you see here. Through this, do you see how the author, Hamoru Arakawa, is able to tie in the cool character design of Ed and Al into their backstories? We open the first page and wonder why one of them has a metal arm and leg, and we wonder why one of them is seemingly in a giant suit of armor, but this is able to be explained upon the multiple facets of their characters and their past. These don't just look cool, they serve a story purpose. Ed lost two of his limbs, they're basically the same injury, but there is a different reasoning and meaning behind each of them. Now we get the sense when Ed and Al are looking at their injuries, they get reminded of their past, but also reminded of their goal of getting their bodies back. By looking at what happens to them, we get a sense of the characters observing their own injuries, remembering their own pasts, 
and how they're going to use these to focus on their own goals. It's a way for us as an audience to look at a visual piece of storytelling and tie it directly to the larger narrative. Not only can we learn about the past of a character through their design, but we can also look at the way that it influences their future. Perhaps your character is a master sniper. They can shoot a wing off of a fly from a thousand yards away. There has been no equal to their skill and there will never be another like them. They're truly the best to ever do it. But what happens to them when they lose their sight? Maybe it was an attack, accident, or disease. But when they lose what was most important to their trade, how do they adapt with such a handicap? Maybe now they wear a badass blindfold and have an aura of mystery around the state of their eyes and how it got there. The visual design shows that they've gone through something, but it's tied directly into the character's emotional narrative as well. Maybe their motivations change because of what happened. In this example, perhaps before their injury, all they wanted to do was to be the best. They wanted to line up the walls of their room with metals shining in all their glory. It was entirely selfish. But now since this character lost their eyes, they can only feel the metals. There's no amazing wall filled with accolades to look at anymore. Everything that they've worked up for until now, until this very moment, has literally and metaphorically been taken from them. So what does this character want now? Maybe they're haunted by the jingle of the metals. They're reminded of another person that they've killed, and now they're racked with guilt thinking about their new representation. They have a feeling of doubt, regret, and fear taking the place of their former pride. Or does this character still want to put one final medal on the wall, but are struggling to figure out how to do this now that their biggest asset has been taken away from them? It's easy to misunderstand what I'm saying, however. Don't walk away from this and think I'm saying nothing in your character's design should be just for looks. At some point, this is totally unsustainable. It reminds me of Star Wars Legends material, where it seemed like every piece of clothing on Han Solo had some story of how he got it, what it represents, and what great feat he performed to earn it. At some point, it's just kind of overkill. If your character has glasses, I don't really care where they got them. What we as readers do care about is for you as the author to focus on the important pieces about your character's design and really sharpen your pencil on it and expand as needed. Just don't go overboard. I think two to three interesting tidbits is more than enough, but overall, I would rather have one incredible piece of information about a character's design and backstory instead of two mediocre ones. Going forward, deploy wisely and sparingly throughout the story. You'll find that when your characters are designed this way, pieces start to fall into place. Because of X, they do Y. Remember that this goes not only for your protagonist, but also for your antagonist. In his book, Araki speaks about the need for your character's motivations to emphasize their character design. He says, By providing an outlet for the ugly feelings we all share, you can depict a more lifelike array of emotions than those of only goodness, and in doing so, can effectively evoke readers' empathy. This is fantastic. Everyone is the hero of their own story, so what does your villain's design do for them? Anytime we read a story, we rely on escapism to draw us in. We get drawn into the conflict between hero and villain, imagining ourselves as a bystander or as one of them. There are certain villains that are unquestionably evil and cruel that we as an audience are disgusted with, but there are also villains, or more accurately antagonists that aren't necessarily evil, that stand in our character's way. It's because of their motivations that we understand where they're coming from and how they contrast with the main character. It's the ultimate conflict between the two that drives their respective narratives forward. Araki goes on to say that the contrast between the two is one of the most important elements for a story. Maybe it's not entirely black and white, nor truly good versus evil, but it's more based on your reader's viewpoints. Does the villain see the greater good as the ultimate goal, and in turn hurts those weaker than him? That might mean that your hero just sees all life as precious, and thinks that even if you get to a perfect utopia achieved by the greater good isn't worth the sacrifice. These two ideologies will inevitably clash, and the way that their characters react to each other will shortly follow. That gives you conflict. 
expecting now to look at a larger group of characters. How do their personalities and past contrast with each other? If your main character and their rival grew up in opposing countries, and while on the path of learning to trust each other, how do they overcome the differences and preconceived notions of the other? In the past, they've only heard awful rumors about the other's people, and it wasn't until they met and otherwise overcame their own personal flaws and bigotry where they realized that they fell for the propaganda of their respective countries. Of course, stories are more than just the hero and the villain. You're going to have side characters. Some might be strong, but a majority of them are going to be weak. Remember that this doesn't always mean in a physical sense, there are plenty of characters who are strong in some aspects and weak in others. The bodybuilder is a weak gymnast and vice versa. It's always easy for the reader to dial in on the main character, but a true artist will be able to make you care about the simplest things and people from their story. If you look at the obstacles that appear in the way of the side character, how do they see these situations and overcome them? While the main character or villain wouldn't even sweat with this particular problem, what is it about your supporting character that has a problem with it? And what do they need to do to get above it? How does that shape them moving forward? This would commonly be referred to as character growth. Let's look at another hypothetical. If you have a side character that has a fear of heights, how does this impact their interactions with the main character and story? Let's say circumstances make it so they're the only one who can climb to the top of a tall tower to retrieve the codes to defuse a bomb. They think they're the last person on earth who's fit for this job, but they overcome their fear, they act in the interest of the greater good, and in turn see how much of a value they can be to the group, and they move forward from there. They might not be cured of their fear altogether, but they are stronger for it. Iron sharpens iron. Maybe at the start of the series, there's someone who can't climb up on a step stool without having a panic attack, and by the end of the series, they're a mountain climbing instructor. There are honestly endless possibilities of quick, efficient, and helpful ways to utilize side characters to make them sympathetic to an audience. They can quickly become fan favorites after being properly utilized. Overall, and as a wrap of the character section of this video, I would create a character in this order. First with their backstory, second with their motivations, third, how those motivations will play off of others, and fourth, how these elements make their visual design. Or you can go much deeper for each character like how Araki famously does. Araki describes this as his character's resume and rightly so. He's clarified that he might not fill out each box depending on the importance of the character, but he does fill in the most important boxes for every character. What do they physically look like? How do they present themselves? Are they educated by books or by the streets? What are their dreams and fears? What do they do for a living? This is absolutely a great way to think about all the aspects of a character, even if you might not directly use every single piece of information you write down. Another great tip from Araki is this. Literally fill out these sheets to practice. Fill one out about yourself, your friends, your family, and your heroes. What did you find out about yourself and others? What made you like or dislike some of these people? What made them interesting as people? As a final note, there is never going to be a time where someone is a master of character writing for every single person that appears on the page. There will be strong and weak characters in a sense of their depth and interest throughout any work that you write or publish, but at the end of the day, the only way to get better at writing characters is to write characters. Practice until you're able to utilize these tips effectively. Next, let's look at the story that these characters are taking place in. I'm going to say that this is the most non-science part of any piece of media. It's easy to talk about character progression. If you put your characters in situations where they suffer, thrive, or grow, there's a good chance that the audience will care about them and connect with them. But stories aren't like that. There are ideas like a three-act structure that gives you a rough outline and how to set up certain events, but it's never going to be A happens, so the best way to progress is through B. For every action, there could be a dozen or more conceivable outcomes. There's no one who can tell you that one path is objectively better than the others, or what specific path you should take. It's going to come down to a gut feeling of the ways that your characters would react to the situation. 
it's the message you want to tell. For every action, there could be a dozen or more conceivable outcomes. Every point needs to logically follow the next. A can lead to either B or C, but it has to make sense why the story leads to either of these points. Matt Stone and Trey Parker from South Park have a really brilliant way of looking at this. I'll link to the video where they talk about this down below. It's only about two odd minutes, so it's definitely worth a watch. But in a nutshell, they specify that your story's events and progressions of the plot should be connected from point A to point B with but and therefore. Avoid and thens at all costs. Jack tried to catch them, but because he was interrupted, the villains got away. Jill pulls an extra shift at the hospital. Therefore, she gets introduced to James, who will change her life forever. If you have, there's a knight, and then he goes to save a princess, and then a dragon comes, and then, and then, and then, there's an evil king, and then, and then, you're just throwing these story beats instead of connecting them organically. Making sure that your story beats lead to each other organically helps me as a reader not only to just basically comprehend what's happening, it's also ensuring that I'm being drawn into a story that makes sense. Everyone has a different preference in terms of the story that they want to see, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to one thing. What your characters do in this story. What is a character but someone in a narrative who is coming across pleasures, hardships, and coming out of it on the other side? Your story is the success they have in doing so. Some stories are extremely lighthearted and filled with highs. Some stories are written by masochists and written with mostly lows. Some sit somewhere in between. But at the end, it's the audience wanting to follow these characters through the world that you've created and how they're going to proceed given the situations presented to them. I think a good story comes from a few points that need to be kept in mind. First, is it interesting? Second, are the payoffs that we as a reader need throughout? And the third, being the author's heart. As a disclaimer, the total comprehensive list of making a good story isn't just these three points, but in my opinion, they're sure going to help, and it's what I personally look for. First is interest. I think this is my hardest requirement, and would probably be the top of most authors' lists if you would ask them. If you don't have a story that's interesting, if you don't make me care, you're probably going to get about negative 15 people who read or watch what you're putting out. Your story doesn't have to be some gripping or epic piece. It doesn't have to be jaw-dropping or something that people are standing in the street corners to promote. But it does have to be interesting. What brings someone back to read the next page? Think about how many stories in our lives we've picked up and put down in all of 30 seconds. We drop it because it's not interesting to us. We sit there as an audience and wonder, what is this all for? If we don't care about the story, then the world building usually follows, and shortly after the characters, and by then, there's nothing left to come back to. What is interesting about your story? Are you rehashing already explored territory like we warned about in the first video? What are you doing to pull someone in? What about your story is something you can hang your hat on? Are you proud of not only the work you put into it, but what you were able to produce from that hard work? Once these things happen, it's interesting. People come back to stories that either pique their curiosities, make them feel something, scare them. It's up to you to bring us in. If it's not interesting, you're not going to get far, plain and simple. Second are payoffs. Part of the reason to have an interest in a story is to see where it's going. Why am I sticking around for a story? I want to see what happens to my favorite characters. What kind of a payoff am I going to have here? Will I feel for the character? Will I be happy? Will I be sad? Will I feel pity? What's going to be the reason to follow them for so long? If you're reading a story and 10 pages in, you couldn't care less if every character ran away and lived happily ever after, or if they all got hit by a bus, what are you sticking around for? 
There has to be something that makes the reader go, I hope they find love and happiness. I hope that this guy gets what's coming to him. I want this group of people to save the world. It's the payoff on our emotional investment. You'll notice that these can also be connected to the character growth we talked about earlier. It's because a great author effortlessly weaves the story and characters together in a packaged deal. Your payoff in the story is the same kind of payoff that we get with our characters and vice versa. Finally, every story needs some kind of heart from the author. I truly and honestly think that there is no story that can rise to the level of great if you just don't feel that the author themselves care about these characters and the story that they're in. There's no way to quantify this. It's purely a gut reaction when reading the story. When I'm reading a story, there needs to be some kind of signal to me that the author is just as emotionally invested while writing it as I am while reading it. There's always a way to look at some other part of the story, perhaps when you get that payoff that I spoke about earlier, and you just have this deep feeling in your heart or soul or whatever it is that this is the moment the author was waiting for, and they can't wait to share it with you. There's something that's happening that makes them just as excited as you are. They aren't just writing this to write this. They're truly and honestly psyched about what they're presenting and how happy they are to finally let the cat out of the bag. These ideas and feelings come off of the page in a way that I just can't describe. It's a vibe you get where things are finally ramping up and the author finally gets to step back and look at the story they've told and say, this is it. This is the moment I've been waiting for. This is the story that I've been wanting to tell. But I can't tell you how to add this to your story. I can't convince you to do this with your story. I can't make you care about it at that deep of a level. But I can tell you that you have to be just as excited as we are to get anywhere significant. The ones that don't have that energy and drive behind them either aren't well received or are short lived. With that incredibly high and vague bar set to end the discussion on story, I think it's about time to bring the video to a close too. All in all, thank you so much for sticking around to watch. I hope that I gave you a lot to chew on, whether it's while writing your own works or when it comes to analyzing someone else's story. Let me know what you thought down below. I'm sure that either myself or one of my now over 500 subscribers will be happy to discuss. I passed that mark since the last video, and I really want to give a genuine thank you to those that have been with me since the beginning and those that are new to the channel today. If you liked what you saw today, drop a like on the video and comment down below on your thoughts and consider subscribing. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter to get random reactions to things. The subject of today's video was actually based on a poll that I did in the community tab. I liked how that turned out. I think I'll be sure to bring out more ideas in future videos and let you as a community influence the direction of the channel in that way. I do have a few ideas in the pipeline that are side projects, ones that I'm going to leave outside of polls and still post, just in terms of having something out there that is unique and a surprise. But I still want to make sure that you guys have a say in future content, so look out for these in the future as well. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks again for stopping by. This is Panel Flow. Until next time. Thank you.